Our first speaker, Deb, um, it's pretty cool. She's pretty cool. She, she's, uh, for someone who worked at a huge organization, uh, which may not be viewed as a place of cool, I think um, it brings a, a really interesting perspective. Uh, some of you may know Deb uh, Mill Schofield is, is having spent time at AT&T. Um, but she is, she's doing an array of, of, of projects um, to help um, uh, uh, older organizations, new organizations, really become uh, innovation athletes. And um, uh, you can read her, her bio and materials here. I, I think it's really neat that um, she's a co-creator of the Business Model Generation. Uh, she is a avid blogger and contributor. Uh, may, many of you may have seen her in the context of the Harvard Business Review work around innovation. Um, and um, we're, we're really excited she's taking the time to, to be with us today. Uh, let's welcome Deb to the podium here. Good morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Hi. Am I? I'm on, right? Okay, cool. Um, so, a little preface. I am originally from New Jersey and New York City, so if I speak really fast, just, you know, say, yo, slow down. Um, I am used to being interrupted. I'm also used to interrupting. So feel free. I don't want to have like, oh, hold your questions and we'll wait till the end and all that. So if you do have questions as I'm talking, um, please raise your hand. Feel free to interrupt. If I feel like, you know, answering, I will. If I don't, I'm like, uh, if I get to for now, whatever. But um, please feel free to, to interrupt me and, and um, we'll go from there. Um, I also think there is, there's live blogging and some of the questions you all are going to be asking are going to be um, put on the site, right, as part of the um, challenges and ideas. So maybe some really cool things could come from that. Um, my definition, which is not the definition, it's just mine, is innovation is invention plus commercialization. Okay. And when I get into my background, oh, you know, this would be good to use, wouldn't it? Yeah. See? Look, there we go. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. Um, you'll understand why I say that. Um, interesting, before when Luis had you guys all chatting and networking, I was like, oh, let's forget the rest of this and let's just, you know, do that. Um, one of the recent blogs or whatever you call it I had in Harvard was, in, was about networking. And I've been asked to think about writing a book. And what I thought was so cool is I've been down at Brown for the last week and then for the next half a week, which is my alma mater. And if you can't tell I'm really proud of that place, then I'm not obvious enough about it. Um, and I met with my former, I was going to say old, but that has a connotation I don't want to put out there, my former advisor, and said to her, you know, I need a new word for networking. She was head of linguistics. My degree was in cognitive science. I helped start the cognitive science program at Brown. And I said, I want a new word for networking because it just seems so selfish and whatever. And so she's been starting to think about it. And she is getting a class that, I didn't take the exact class, but a class that I basically took many years ago, before these guys were born, um, to crowdsource among the Brown students a new word for networking based on my networking with my advisor from decades ago at Brown. And I think that's just the coolest story of what we can do today and how important that whole networking and time is for innovation. So, genetic modification. Where's Cargill? Car so I hope I don't get this personal for, you know, any like seeds or anything like that. Um, how many of you guys are from New England? How many of you, I think you like, see, I am from New Jersey. How many of you guys? Um, how many of you all have seen a blue lobster? Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is how do you create a blue lobster? How many of you guys have actually eaten a blue lobster? Oh, shoot. Good, okay, just change it. Um, they are rare, but they do exist, and where we have a place up in Maine, you're not supposed to eat them. I don't know if it's law, I don't know what it is, but you just don't, kind of formal protocol. Um, changing the DNA of your organization to become more innovative is doable. I think it is also rather simple, 
but it is really, really not easy. And we need to differentiate between things being simple and things being easy because they're very, very different. Um, another question, how many people in here have kids? Okay, good, because let me tell you, there's a lot of analogies between innovation in companies and managing people and having kids. And I have no idea why AT&T let me manage people before I had children. I think it was a really, really big mistake. Um, okay. So, why am I qualified to talk about this? Because Louise thought I was. Um, no, I was raised in a rather heretical home. Um, so, from an early stage, we went to school, we went to public school, but on Tuesdays, the museums in New York City were free, so we didn't go to school on Tuesdays. We went into the city every single Tuesday and we went to the museums. And then maybe on Fridays, we didn't go in either. Because the view was, if the average grade in a public school was a C, the more we were out, the better we do. <laughs> um, and so I was kind of raised to be heretical, to challenge the status quo. For me, Brown was the perfect place because you have to hack your education there. There's no core requirement. So that's where I learned to be an entrepreneur and innovate. And one of the first things was creating the cognitive science program, which at the time I had no clue was an entrepreneurial thing but in retrospect it was. Then I went to work for Bell Labs. So how many people here have heard of Bell Labs? Do you know something? When I work with college kids today, they don't even know what Bell Labs is. Like feel old, but also the tremendous resource. So, and I wrote a post on this a while ago. At Bell Labs we were paid to invent and corporate was paid to kill whatever we invented. <laughs> Um, Google has nothing on what it was like to work in the labs, and I don't know how many of us appreciate it, but it was really just like the most amazing place to play, invent, create. You know, you could just have lunch with Arno Penzias, very flat organizationally in reality. I mean, there was a hierarchy, but it didn't matter, which, believe me, when I moved to corporate and would, would just walk in a, you know, president's office, they were like, well, you can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean I can't do that? I'm an employee, I'm a shareholder, he's a president, why not? You could do that at Bell Labs. Um, Bell Labs invented the solar battery in the 50s. Call waiting, caller ID existed in the late 1950s. Why in the world would anybody want to know who's calling? Um, cellular phones were started and piloted in the early, mid-60s. Unbelievable inventions, right? The transistor, all that stuff really no clue how to commercialize. And that was, I think, some of what led to, frankly, the downfall of AT&T. So um, what did I do there? Because I was really lazy, I did something that I thought would make my life easier, I ended up getting a patent for that. I learned that patents are political tools. So in order to get one of the businesses to build what we were patenting, you put their name on the patent, they'll build it. Okay, so that was one of the early lessons in invention and innovation is you have to give credit to people who have squat doodle to do with it in order to get buy-in. It is, it's got to be about the bigger picture and you've got to reward people and compensate them to understand that even if their name's not on it, it has a play. Um, I was then asked to design the next generation core network for the United States. There were three of us, it was 1991, and we in our extreme naivete thought that it should be an IP-based network. 91, at the labs, we were moving stuff all over in the 80s. We all used email. It's how I broke up with my then boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband. So email changed course during the years. Um, we presented that to the uh, board of AT&T, and they thought that was the dumbest thing they had ever heard of. And so we all moved our AT&T stock in our 401k the next morning. That was managed by Fidelity just uh, happened to be, right, into other things. And in my mind, that's the day AT&T went terminal. And if you look at, and this is posed a lot, IBM versus AT&T, IBM, knowingly or not, has had a mentality of constant experimentation. And I think the reason they are where they are today, which is an amazing position to be in considering their 100-year history, is because they've constantly experimented and iterated. AT&T stopped. And it might take you 30 years to die, 
but you are on a downward decline. So what else? I, uh, I do consulting. I'm a, early, I'm a partner in an early stage venture capital firm in Cleveland where, I mean, it is so cool what's happening there, but I digress, but it is really cool what's happening in Northeast Ohio. Um, lots of neat startups. I teach a business model innovation course based on the book that I helped co-create with Alex at Oberlin College, that bastion of liberalism, out of, God forbid, the conservatory. That's really amazing, right? Um, I mentor kids at Brown, and I mentor startups at Brown. And the most important reason I think I am fully able to discuss this, having started up and started down companies, is because I'm a mom. And fundamentally, to think of how do you ingrain a mindset of innovation gets right to, at least to me, the core of how do you raise your kids, to keep that fresh perspective instead of becoming inured and linear once they get into the real world or start that way. So, blue lobsters. What does it have to do with anything? What I want to talk about is the challenge before us in terms of creating a mindset of innovation. And frankly, guys, it's always about the people which is why I think it's so hard for companies to create an innovative mindset if they don't have one. And frankly, one of the most fun, I like the word funnest, it's not a word, but it is now, um, one of the most fun parts of innovation is ruckus, random collisions of unusual suspects. Um, I quote my friend Saul Kaplan, down an hour down south of here at the Business Innovation Factory, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, that's one of the hardest things, too, corporately to think of, is how do you create a ruckus? And if you do those and do those well, you can actually start creating blue lobsters. Okay. By the way, a blue lobster is about one in one million is the average. We have a place up in Maine, um, in Pemaquid. I don't know how many of you folks know Maine. Our lighthouse is on the Maine quarter, um, which my daughter takes full credit for. Um, Right by us on the Damariscotta River, and everything up there is a river even though it's really salt water, is the Darling Marine Center for the University of Maine. And they study blue lobsters as well as other stuff, right? So when they're done studying these blue lobsters, they just throw them back in the water, alive. And so we actually, I can't prove it, but anecdotal, we have more blue lobsters than other places in Maine. We have at least one or two blue lobsters a year at our local co-ops. Why? Because there is a hub of R&D, right? There's a hub of blue lobsters that create more blue lobsters. So think about how can you create a hub of innovators to create more innovation. I love looking at analogy kind of stuff. Okay, so to Lewis's point, the 21st century is a little different than the last one, to say the least, right? 20th century was fairly linear. Oh, am I messing you up when I keep turning my head? Okay, good. They told me I can't look right. I have to keep looking left. Um, so the 20th century, this is where, you know, I, I have to keep looking left, 20th century. Um, right into the mic. Very linear. You know, things were predictable, fairly so. The 21st century, taking off of Luis's diagram, is very, very messy. And for someone who likes things neat and clean, but now having kids, a husband and a dog, you can forget it. Mess leaves you so much room for opportunity. It, no, but seriously, um, we are in a very messy stage, and I think the only thing that's predictable going forward is more mess, more change, and the velocity of change. So you either got to get with it or go to a cloister somewhere. Um, I mean, that's a little... Old, but it is, I think, what's going to happen. We are in a very messy world that's going to continue to be messy. And if you can learn and apply and iterate faster, you will have a blast. Um, and there is a lot of opportunity in mess. So I think another way to look at it is the 21st century is about attitude. The 20th century was about aptitude. Core competencies, core skills, all this core stuff, to, you know, we knew this expertise, that expertise, all that kind of stuff. The 20th century talked about tangible things like, um, so I asked my 14-year-old, what do you think about when I say the 20th century? He brought up the atom bomb, Hitler. Um, he didn't know what the heck AOL was. Um, 
Bruce Springsteen, um, which I feel goes right into the 21st century as well. Um, but if we look at, thank you, yes. And I can remember when it was two bucks at the Stone Pony in Asbury Park with a fake ID to hear Bruce Springsteen. Um, but the atom bomb and the whole, um, the genomes, all that stuff started coming out. We had processes, Six Sigma, Lean, um, cars started, the infrastructure to support cars. We had totalitarianism, fascism, communism, a bunch of isms. That, by the way, if you think back, and I'm not advocating this in the least, but under Tito and under Hussein, Saddam Hussein, you had command and control. And you had a common person for them to hate, which kept sectarian violence down. Just a little thing to think about as we shift into this world of anarchic democracy. Um, silent movies, AOL. I am so shocked they're still around. Um, anyway, one way to do things, right? I think one of the greatest examples of moving from the 20th to the 21st was in the 20th century, century we saw the, um, the rise and fall, I like Gibbons, the fall and decline of the Roman Empire, um, the rise and fall of Microsoft and the fall and rise of Apple. And, you know, we can look at that from a business standpoint, but it's such very different views of the world. Acquire, copy versus create. The 21st century, I think, focuses more on intangibles. It's on the soft stuff, which is really, really, really hard. We don't know how to deal with soft stuff. We're not used to measuring it. We don't really have good measures for it. So we have networked like organizations. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of W.L. Gore other than Gore-Tex. Okay, they're um, very lattice in terms of their structure. Um, Google, et cetera. So there are a lot of, you know, flatter, more networked organizations. Not many, but starting. Um, we're in an always-on world. Google smartphones are now external RAM to the brain. And I forget the quote, but Einstein, way back when, made some quote about the fact that if you can look it up, why bother remembering it? Which, you know, a lot of teachers don't like. And in fact, my husband, who's a professor of physics, now gets ticked when students come to him to ask him a question they could have Googled and found out themselves. Um, we are on an always-on world. God bless you. Um, smart cars, smaller cars, technology is taking over. And instead of one way, I love this picture, I like the way I'm like pointing over there, um, of that sign where everything's going different ways. There isn't one way of doing things. There are multiple ways of getting things done. Um, we're into a world where totalitarianism is falling apart. Democracy is messily maybe coming out, or maybe it'll just be a more softer, subtler form of totalitarianism before it evolves into something more as well. Everything's changing, and it's a whole different set of skills, talents, and mindsets. So aptitude was good. Attitude mindset is what's going to lead to success, which gets to innovation. It's not just knowing how. It's knowing where and why. And I love asking why several times, like up to the fifth time, which annoys the heck out of certain people. What's easier to change, people or processes? Processes, right. People are such a pain in the tush, you know? I mean, let's face it. We really are hard to change and motivate. But putting in processes, programs, and tools does not make you innovative. It helps you a lot. It gives you the path. It gives you the resources. But if you don't have the mindset to go along with it, it's hard to have it be ingrained. And in fact, I have a client that's been using the Imaginetics platform, which has been great. Their champion got so frustrated with the corporate culture there that he left, and nothing's happening. So you do need people, and you need that champion. You've got to change the DNA, and a way to do that is think of changing behavior. Don't worry so much at first about the intent. Worry about the action. How can we motivate them to do what they will enjoy doing more how can we motivate ourselves to exhibit the behavior you want? And then after a while, you might start thinking that way. When I was three, 
we had this place where there was a front door here, closets on either side, and little corners. My sister's four years older, and when we were being punished, Daddy would say, now you go stand in the corner and think about what you've done. And when I was three, I said to him, you can tell me where to stand, you can't tell me what to think. <laughs> to which he went into my mother and said, that's it, I'm done, she's yours. Um, but, but guys, that's the issue with changing a culture. If you start telling people and yourselves where to stand, and make it a positive experience, you eventually will start changing how you and the rest of your organization thinks. So it's not easy, but start with yourself. So when, when someone says to me, or a client says, well, how are we going to become more innovative? I do the old, you got a mirror? You know, if you don't start yourself, and it's not that you have to create, but you have to start nurturing, supporting, and encouraging it, why the heck should anybody else? Right? It's the old walk the talk stuff. Okay, so people, people, people. Location, 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 right? That's what they say in real estate. People, people, people. Um, for most of us growing up, and even I would submit people in their mid-30s and on up, who I think are very young, um, they grew up, we grew up in a world where you went to college, you got a job, you might have stayed there for 30 years till you retired with your pension, and your 401k, you actually might have had both. Um, and that was the way the world worked. It was linear, it was steady, it was stable, it was predictable. My kids are 12 and 15, and they do not expect to go work for anybody. They think they'll create their own thing, maybe start a business with some buddies, but the thought of a job at a company is like, what? Um, and if you do, like you're there for two, three years, you know, why would I stay forever unless maybe I started it? Um, which I t keep telling them is a good idea to take care of their parents in their own age. Um, you know, you follow this path. You did not make waves. You did not rock the boat because you wouldn't get the corner office. The world has been turned upside down for most of us, frankly, in a rather short period of time. And so helping people understand that, I think... As a leader in your organization for innovation, you need to personally commit to doing this. So we're not going to be forestalled by the tyranny of the urgent, okay? Um, one of the lines I love, and I see this with a lot of my clients, is what's the biggest barrier to success in innovation? Success. Well, it's working. What's the problem, right? And so I think one of the other roles we have as leaders is to, is to have some little constant level of agita. I don't know what the, I never know what the English angst, I don't know, a little bit of a, a upset going on, you know, just not a total complacent comfort, a little bit on edge to keep that going. Um, because the organization is going to fight new stuff and challenging the status quo, right? This, this is some new alien ant virus coming in, it doesn't know how to deal with it. The cells are all going to swarm around and try to kill this thing. And so you're going to be butting up against that status quo all the time. And you need to help people understand that it's okay and safe to butt up against the status quo. Safety, I think, is really big, folks. When you look at helping yourself and your people understand how to change, it's not safe to challenge. It's not safe to think differently. Okay? We have so made it not safe. From kindergarten, you give the wrong answer, and oh my gosh, what happens? You get the little, like, I don't know what the acceptable or needs improvement on your thing. I mean, it's nuts. So you have to really be committed yourselves personally. Make it a priority. And when you start dropping down in priority with innovation and new ways of thinking, you've just told the organization you're not serious. Um, your biggest asset is your people. Now, there's this book I read, and I'm not here to promote the book, but yes, I am, because it's really great, and I wish I'd had it when I had kids, too. The analogies, I'm telling you, between raising children and running a company and being part of innovation is huge. Dan and Chip Heath wrote a book a while ago called Made to Stick. They just wrote a book, well, Jeff, it's probably been like a year, time flies, called Switch. What is it? How to change things when change is hard. Um, and they put in context something that so many of us, I think, have believed in but didn't have a good analogy for it, right? So if your biggest asset is people, that's usually not where you're investing your money, right? 
You're investing it in capital equipment and other stuff. One of my most wonderful clients during the recession said, great, the lines are running slower. Nobody has an excuse for not getting trained now. And spent a lot of money training their people from press men all the way up because there was no good excuse not to. We need to give our people and ourselves clarity, okay? When, when people don't do as you would like them to do, when my kids aren't behaving, when I'm not behaving, I, don't, I think we tend to import some malice of forethought. I think a lot of the reason is we don't know where we're going, we don't know what the expectations are, we don't know why we're doing this. And so to help understand, okay, we want to go to innovation. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? So clarity, what is the long-term vision for this? In three, five, ten years, this is what we see the world looking like for us as a corporation, as an organization, as a business. So we're going to go this way. We're going to do planning and strategy and all that kind of stuff, give direction and answer why. Well, why are we going that way? Well, why, why, why? And I know this is trivial, guys, but ask why five times. It is so incredibly powerful and so underutilized. So if I can, from a logical brain standpoint, think of where am I going, why am I going there, and that's the rider, this is the analogy they use, and then think of the elephant. Motivation, what do I care? Give the motivation, you have to have short term too, and this is how you balance long and short, is here's where we're going and here are the steps along the way to get there. It's not a 12-year leap, and guys, everything we're doing is 12 years out. You have to give some short-term goals. So, and, and we need to do that with innovation. It's not like we're going to have the final product by now, but if we have a prototype we can take to a customer and have them play around with and iterate within six months or three months or whatever, depending, you keep that momentum going. A lot of times, I think we take fatigue in our, in our people as a sign of, I love the word sloth, I don't know why I just do, um, and apathy. When in fact they're tired because they don't know what you want out of them, they don't know where you're going, and they keep doing this or that, and it's just mentally fatiguing to be in that state of not knowing why or what and what it means. Once you can do that, then here's the path. We have processes, we have procedures, we have tools, we have prototypes, we have all this stuff to help let you achieve those goals in the short term to get to the long term. Make it bite-sized chunks. So, okay, let's put this in perspective of some real life examples. Um, Don Berwick, who just recently stepped down as head of Medicare, Medicaid, and stuff, um, he was the CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. This goes back Oh my gosh, like almost 10 years. Um, and this is when people were starting to discover the error rates in, um, med in medicine. So he decided we have to do something about this. We're losing a lot of people, lives that don't need to be lost. And um, he got his people together and said, in 18 months, we are going to save 100,000 lives through reduced error, medical error. That was like one of those big hairy goal things, right? And everyone was like, yeah, right. But he put it out there, 18 months, 100,000 lives, let's go. That is, think clarity, the rider, okay? That's where I'm going. Motivation, you can say this is manipulative, it probably was, not probably it was, but it worked. He had some people get up and talk about losing a child or a spouse or a loved one because of a medical error. Okay, well that kind of gets right to you, all right? So you need some motivation to work on this, there you go. And then, to make it really easy, a one-page enrollment form for CEOs of hospitals to sign, not, you know, a book, and training, manuals, policies, procedures, all like a turnkey, here, go do it. And within 18 months, they had saved something like 130-some thousand lives, okay? It sounds really simple. It actually is really simple. It's not necessarily really easy. Um, Fifth, Business Innovation Factory is an organization down in Providence. Um, Saul, who termed Ruckus, is the leader of that. 
And they have an annual conference that I call, several of us, in fact, John Hagel and I were talking about this, because John Hagel's like at every TED, an intimate, humble TED conference. So it is intimate, people are real, um, and at the conference last year, a woman from Houston talked, Angela Blanchard, and she works with the inner cities in Houston, and especially after Katrina, on revitalizing and rebuilding. And she has this great phrase, you can't build on broken. So what do we do when we see a problem in our workplace or our lives anywhere? Well, let's look at what's not working. Why don't we ever look at what is working, right? We don't, in general. But if you look at the bright spots, if you look at what's working, first of all, you switch from a positive to a negative. I, and there's all this neuroscience behind getting more energy when you're positive, et cetera, et cetera. But you just shift the perspective. People get more engaged. And how can we apply what's working there somewhere else? And that's another way to start changing the DNA, if you will, in the mindset. Look at what's working and apply that. Angela Blanchard. Um, if you go to the, it's businessinnovationfactory.com, all one word. Look up Fifth Seven. There's a video of her talk there. It's, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, one of, um, one of my clients who I dearly love, they're a 163-year-old, seventh-generation, privately held family business, the third oldest and largest in the United States. They're over about a billion dollars. They're in packaging. Wow, that's like really cool to make round boxes. No, um, not really. But actually, it has become so. And what they did back in 2005 when the business was really tanking and the family was going to put it up for sale, they did a bet your career kind of thing. And they laid out a strategy and framework for here's where we're going to be by 2010. Names, numbers, assigned, everything. So they, clarity, long term, I keep pointing there because that's what I see. So I'll go like this. Um, you know, they gave the long term perspective. Here's how we're going to get there. And they said why it matters. So even a janitor at a plant knew how he or she could impact the business and how it mattered to them. The motivation, small town, well, there's several towns, but it's a small community. Here's the impact on the community. You know, if we don't do well, it affects property taxes. It affects money for schools. It, I mean, it, there's a real wonderful story all about that. And then they laid out the plan, and here's where we're going. A very clear message for the rider, the elephant, and the path. And they have met or exceeded goals. And during the recession, in the grocery store, one of the plant workers went up to the president and shook his hand, because the president actually goes shopping in the grocery store by himself, um, and thanked him because he'd just been down at the union hall where a bunch of his buddies who worked for other companies were sitting there trying to find jobs, and he just bought a new Ford, what are Fords, like F-1050s or whatever. So he just bought a new Ford truck because of the clarity, the motivation, and the path. I could go on and on. Oh, they also had this really cool thing. Okay, so I, my clients are really ADD-ish, and I think I'm picking that up. Um, so in one of the plants, a janitor noticed that um, toilet paper was starting to get used more. I love leading indicators. <laughs> and you can make all sorts of joke about trailing indicators when you talk about this toilet paper. But anyway, um, and he felt comfortable enough to go to the GM of that plant and said, you know, in the last two weeks, we're using more toilet paper. So the general manager said, okay, what happened two weeks ago? And started looking, and there was a problem with the press, and it wasn't being, I don't know, I don't remember all the details, but there was a problem with the press, so it was down more. And the more the press was down, the more people were taking breaks and going to the bathroom. So, I mean, that sounds really funny and weird, right? But it's true. Toilet paper became a leading indicator. But the janitor felt empowered to look and notice and free to go to the general manager and actually say something. And instead of saying, oh, you know, just, well, cut back on the toilet paper in there. Too bad for the employees. Oh, gee, why are we using more toilet paper? That's pretty interesting. Okay. So, changing your genetic code. 
you want people that are out there looking ahead. There's a really basic way to start, guys. Hire for it. You know? I mean, hire for people that think differently, that are innovative, that will challenge the status quo. You could even look around within your organization at various people you've dismissed because they are heretical, they're a pain in the neck, they always ask these questions, they're always challenging. Maybe you should listen to them. You know, they might have an idea. Um, if you hire, you recruit, you train, you develop, you encourage the traits you want your people to have, and you do that for yourself as well, odds are pretty good it'll start happening. But you have to do it consistently, good times, bad times. And then, oh my gosh, you should actually reward for that. Reward, recognize, compensate, and it isn't always money. Okay, that's really easy. It is so easy to throw money. Here, have a, have a you know, little raise here, a little bonus here. What if you, you know, put them in the paper? What if you gave them all, you know, some extra time? There are tons of different ways to recognize and reward people, including just saying thank you. You know, just saying thank you and a pat on the back. Don't you think that you like that, right? Um, you also have to have that foundation that we touched on and give them autonomy and freedom. And that's really scary. I'm going to lose control. Well, too bad you already lost control. You just might not have acknowledged it yet. And you never really had control anyway. So get over your delusion, self-delusion, face reality. You get that when you get a teenager too. Um, I think. Um, but get into a mode of trusting your people. Give them the autonomy and freedom to do it. Rarely do people really screw up and abuse corporate resources in general. Look for leading indicators, okay? Not just toilet paper. There are others. You know, if you're not investing in training and education, if you're not investing in tools to help them do their job, don't get so surprised when your trailing indicators aren't so good. The other thing I would ask you guys to think about, and this is hard, is... Outcome versus output, okay? In my mind, which is warped to, we all know, to speak of, output is money, profit, revenue, that kind of stuff. Outcome is meaning and purpose. And I don't mean to get all philosophical here, but I will. Because fundamentally, if you are not delivering a meaningful outcome to your customers, if you're not doing a job they really need done in a way that's easy for them, you will not need to worry about output for too long. But everything we measure in the world today is output-based, not outcome-based. I think you can have an advantage by looking at outcome-based measures, which might not be neat and clean, might have margin of errors, and might be a little qualitative. But if you don't, you don't have to worry about output. And it, you know, it's subtle, but it ain't so subtle. It really does create a different way of thinking about things. Hershey's has, I love Hershey's because, you know, it's chocolate. Hershey's has an annual prize for um, the exalted order of the extended neck. And so they give a prize away to a group that took a flyer on some initiative, on some innovative idea, and it failed. And so one of the biggest things to overcome in an organization is that fear. Fear of losing control, fear of screwing up, I mean, it is huge, and I don't think we understand it. And Justine Musk, who blogs for Harvard and something else, just had a great blog post on fear and getting over fear. Yes, you may. This is not a new conversation about fear, right? Right. The fear, we all know, is such a big barrier to innovation. But really, 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 like, what are organizations doing to help people um, break through that barrier? Um, some of the things I've seen done include, um, you know, it's performance management stuff, but at least trying. Okay? So we're going to measure you on the, the number of at-bats. And, you know, if you get a single or a double, it's okay. We're not going to just measure you on grand slams or home runs or whatever. But help, but um, reward and recognition for 
taking a stab at it for self organizing a team and for taking the learnings and then applying them so if you fail and you look don't learn then you really have failed if you failed and learned you just iterated you know you haven't really failed um, you could call it intentional learning and so by by compensating people and um, making their performance based by number of times you're able to just get it back and try you can start shifting that um, and then applying the learnings as well trust what did I hear so what did Reagan say he said trust yet verify and someone was saying Obama needs to with our Iran verify and then trust um, you know we all talk about trust it's such a lovely word we all say we do it and most of us don't right because that's why we have performance review and all that stuff too um, I have been using this sounds really weird but the classic virtues of Aristotle and Plato and applying them to innovation so not saying you know oy vey you're such a schmuck you need some courage but putting it to the task so um, if you're responsible for this project what is the virtue you need most example um, at one of my clients the CFO is always looked at as a person who's going to squash any innovation that comes along we have our ROI we have our margin of error yada 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 end of it right she took upon herself the virtue of courage and applied that specifically to I am going to look for alternative sources of funding rather than internal there are all sorts of grants and stuff out there for things and I'm going to use different factors in calculating ROI and I might look at interim ROI if you will so if we're starting a project I'm not going to measure ROI by the end point I'm going to have little steps in between of measuring ROI to show we are succeeding as we get there it went from oh my gosh we have to have Gail at the meeting to Gail is now and her team always asked to be at the meetings and because of her financial knowledge she has created some really cool new business models for them all because she decided I have to become more courageous when it comes to money and innovation okay and I can go through more examples but we need to trust our people and really trust them if we've hired them and we're paying them don't we have some level of faith that they're going to do what they're doing and don't we have hope that they can accomplish that and support them so we need to bring that in and I think if you do that eventually you start embedding DNA so I have to move on because I'm talking too long ruckus random collision of unusual suspects this is Saul's phrase I just love it when you create a ruckus it is so cool what happens um, and I think we need to get out of our offices our cubicles our industries and go see the world out there so my packaging client we go to a museum before we do um, any more research before we do planning serendipity you guys heard that word okay in I have to get my numbers right 1754 Horace Walpole wrote a letter to Horace Mann in England and coined the term serendipity based on the story of the three princes of serendip which is a Persian Iranian story fairy tale about these three princes of serendip which is the old name for Ceylon Sri Lanka who went on a quest and in the process had all these happy accidents along the way not on the quest and discovered really cool things okay so where does serendipity come into play in your organization when do you allow serendipitous things to happen so I went to my first fifth fifth six in 2010 this is a fine drawing of the network analysis of my Twitter network before BIF six and this is it after BIF six okay and I met folks that are artists musicians education a 12 year old kid that was doing a green fuel program on and on and on who have helped me bring tremendous insights and talents to clients I never would have known of before most of whom had nothing to do with business okay you guys have got to get yourselves and your people out there let them go to really weird strange things like okay so I love Edward Hopper he experimented with this uh, impressionistic stage that's the Pemaquid lighthouse he did in 1929 on the top but his comfort zone was in the photorealism of Nighthawk 1942 and that's what most of us know him for very few people know him for his impressionistic art 
You need to look for the heretics in your organization. Not so you can burn them at the stake. Um, we generally don't do that anymore, at least in the West. Um, but look for them, encourage them, support them, listen to them. There are misfits there that have tremendous ideas. We need to create orange apples. You know, don't compare oranges and apples. Well, heck yeah, do. So there's a joke in my house because my husband went to Michigan. If I give you orange juice and club soda and say, what do you want? A kid from Michigan will say, oh, I'll have orange juice or club soda. And then the joke is, if you're from Brown, you'll say, I have both. There we get into the linear, nonlinear. It's a little, you can do Ohio State, Michigan, whatever you want to do. Um, but we need to compare things that don't compare and see what we can learn from them. This picture I love, I have no idea who drew it, but everybody's on the same plane, but they're all looking at it totally differently. And the other one is, there's this author called Ishmael Kadar out of Albania, and um, he had to smuggle stuff out, and I kept thinking of Albania, they kind of went a certain way, I wonder if Egypt could go that way, and Matt Kaminsky from the Wall Street Journal actually said, could Egypt look at a path like Albania is taking? And I think if you do this and get out and look at weird things that make no sense but could make sense, you can actually create a blue lobster. Thanks. <laughs>